weekly on Transformers Chronicles. Johnny Maggie said they were going to be here this month, so we should be good to go. No, bah. You haven't checked the messages, have you? They cannot make it. Something about uh, a brand of squash and a short person. What? <sighs> okay, I got Pat on deck for this month. John said he, uh, he'd be back this month. Would he abandon Transformers Chronicles in our darkest hour? John, where have you been? We missed you. Ah, uh, you know, here and there. Uh, the Autobots were kind enough to just teleport me back to Long Box Crusade headquarters and saved me hundreds of dollars in travel costs. The Autobots have a transporter? I, I thought they only had a trebuchet. Yeah, uh, Maggie was stayed behind having some sort of conversation about ethics with the spanner and the space bridge and something else, even though, and to fix the trebuchet, even though I told them that technology was from borns ago. <laughs> Classic trebuchet and born bits. The guys are back just in time to see the heist of the century here on Transformers Chronicles. The Longbox Crusade presents... Transformers Chronicles. Hello and welcome back to Transformers Chronicles. I'm Delvin, aka The Dark Web. And in case you are new to the show, welcome. And let me tell you what this thing is all about. We're going for a wild, crazy ride, chronicling the awesome, wacky, and sometimes corny world of Marvel Comics, The Transformers. But I'll never be going at it alone. Let's meet my chronicling companions first up. We have the founder of the Long Box Crusade, the novice of the Transformers world, the seeker of the Matrix of knowledge. He is Pat Sampson. Pat. What's going on, man? Oh, you know, not much, Delvin. Uh, just kind of been hanging out on this island for a while and now looking to get a, you know, catch a ride on a jet back home somewhere. But I, they said, pilot said that there might be a couple stops here and there, but mm -hmm. and I, I may have to pay some way to get it, me there where I need to be, but uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see where I get. Are, are you, by any chance, are you cold? Do I, a little bit. Get a little bit cold, yeah, and you know, they, I go from warm yeah. beaches, and mm -hmm. now it's like just freezing cold outside. Yeah, uh, I mean, hey, you better press that button, you know, and, and get some help just in case. We'd hate for you to, you know, freeze to death. Well, luckily, um, freezing mixed with boiling is something that Pat has much experience of from his many years living in Wisconsin. Uh, what what is that? What was that voice that I've heard? It, it's it's none other than the voice of the lesser half of Mary with content. His name, video, Jonathan Schaefer Hames. Uh, it's been so long, man. It feels like since, since I've introduced you, you know, like Transformers Librarian, he's that too, and, and stuff like that. But but John, for the first question that I have to ask you uh, is, uh, we, we did a bit last uh, episode in Chronicles mm -hmm. 48. Uh, you know, I, I had Jared mention something in the script, something a, a, about a squash and, and, and yeah. maybe a short person. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you mind filling the audience in on exactly what the heck it was I was talking about? Uh, yeah, I might as well do that. I'd call it the elephant of the room, but I don't think that metaphor works pretty well for this. But before that, hi, guys. It's been way too long and um, i have missed you folks maggie has missed you folks too she's a little under the weather today so she couldn't be here but she's going to be here next month i told her it would be explosive um but yeah maggie and i have moved back up to my hometown uh which is butternut wisconsin hence the squash and um the short people thing oh god uh, <laughs> We have a whole thing on the next episode of Married with Content that's coming out where we really go into it. 
but uh, it's short. <laughs> uh, a resident of Butternut, Wisconsin from back in the day was a professional wrestler. As we all know, as fans of professional wrestlers, you have colorful nicknames. And he, back in the 19, I believe, probably 40s or 50s, he was doing it. Uh, his name was Charles Fisher, and he was about five foot one. So he was Charles the Midget Fisher. And to honor him, They've named the school's mascot are the Midgets. Now that's either, you know, both touching and ill-advised and all sorts of other things. But yeah, that's that's what we are up here. We're, we're Midgets. Sometimes things can be two things at once. Yeah, you <laughs> very much can. What's hilarious, though, is that Hurley, Wisconsin, which is about a half hour or so from here and we're in our basketball conference they are also the midgets i don't know why i don't know if charles lived there too for a while <laughs> i kind of hope so i don't want another one going yeah midgets now that's a great mascot we're gonna uh. <laughs> as far as i know you know no one we haven't had like a, a little person defam anti-defamation league sent a letter or something i imagine if they did they probably people probably would look seriously at that but really it hasn't occurred to them <laughs> that it would be a considered offensive and maybe you know it isn't but hey i didn't name it i wouldn't have chosen it we got it, but that's where we are. So hmm. convince the making fun of and or questions. <laughs> I, I have no questions other than if those two teams met, like, you mm -hmm. know, and it's in a competition and one Which of them lost, would, would, would you say that they came up short? Oh, you know my what? God. Yeah. Ne ne see? Never. Oh. Uh, just, uh, uh, oh. just uh, uh, look, <laughs> uh, apologies to everyone. I, 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 I missed I could. you so much. <laughs> Wait a minute. I think that one went over my head. Oh, my God. You know, all of these jokes are just falling short. No, all right. Tell uh, you me, know what, how about you? What have you been up to? Yes, Listen. we should keep going before the bar is, is set lower. And that pun <laughs> was not lower, intended. Yes. That pun was lower. honestly not intended. It, it's, okay. um, it, that was just a break. Things are going okay here in Charlotte. Uh, who was named for uh, Queen Charlotte. And um, I have no idea what Queen Charlotte type was. Um, yeah, I cannot complain. Things are going well. Uh, podcasting is going well. Uh, I do my jujitsu thing. That's going well. Uh, I cannot complain. The uh, most up-to-date thing I have by the time this thing comes out, um, I will have gone to San Antonio and back uh, to be the first salute to uh, one of my friends, Jake Beeman, who is uh, going to be one of the United States Air Force's newest airmen. So um, very happy and very proud um, of him and for him. Um, not so happy that I got to get rid of my beard that I've been growing the past uh, five plus months, <laughs> but sometimes sacrifices must be made for the greater good. And with that, oh wait, very quickly, I just want to say a, a rest in peace uh, to Don Perlin. Uh, Don Perlin passed away relatively uh, recently ago, and he has his place in Transformers lore, drawing some of the earlier issues of uh, Marvel Comics, the Transformers. And I just wanted to say a very quick uh, rest in peace. And I know I've mentioned before on previous shows, I, I, I feel like I, I and we need to report this news to show not only bona fides, but respect as well for the uh, men and women who uh, put their time and efforts into such a work that we have decided to honor. Uh, but man, I, I will be glad when an episode or two or three or 10 go by and we don't have to say goodbye to uh, these friends. Yeah. Rest in peace, Don. Yeah. You did some good stuff. Did some great stuff for certain. And with that... <laughs> The purpose of this podcast will be tackling all of Marvel's Transformers comics in order, starting with issue one and working our way to the series end at issue 80. We will answer any questions that are brought up to the best of our ability and see how these books we loved then as a kid hold up to our eyes as an adult. Now this podcast is guaranteed to be, you guessed it, more than meets the eye. So Pat, John, let's find out exactly how devious a planner Starscream really is right after the promo break. The Transformers will return after these messages. 
Do you like the Transformers? <laughs> yes. Do you like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? <laughs> Do you like IDW Comics? And comic book podcasts? <laughs> then come check out Ninjas and Bots. Each week we look at an issue of Transformers. Or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from their IDW Comics incarnation. We drop episodes every Saturday morning. Just like the cartoons we loved as a kid. The show can be found on your favorite podcatcher and at johnreadscomics.com. See you then. We now return to the Transformers. Welcome back. The issue we will be covering today is Transformers issue 49. And here is John with the cover description. Okay, Fortress Maximus is still tearing his head off from the corner box, which below it is uh, tells us is worth a the comic is worth a dollar, and it is approved by the Comics Code Authority. He's tearing his head off as if to say, "I can't believe that I am only in this issue for one panel." That's in front of an orange background. Uh, the Transformers logo is in red with yellow trim, and more than meets the eye is also in yellow, and in yellow, Decepticon fights Decepticon below hand is written, and we see just that, or at least the beginning of that, is two groups of bad guys prepare to charge at each other, and in the foreground, another guy who I think is a bad guy, if I remember properly, uh, Starscream, is grinning like a maniac and holding Buster Witwicky uh, tightly in his hand with his other hand rushing up ready to do some sort of menace to him. And a uh, text box below hand says that while Starscream conquers all. I, Starscream, am now your leader. Um, this one's kind of fun. I like this. This one's got a lot of characters crammed on it. There's, I would have gone without a lot of the pretender Decepticons in the back are kind of faded out green colored. And so is rat Matt for some reason that, but other than that, it's kind of interesting. I, I like the yellow, uh, background thing. If I had one complaint, I'd say I'm not a big fan of Starscream's face on this, but it's cool. No, it's, this one struck me as almost a tribute to an another comic. Am I just making that up, or either of you guys? Ricky? It's got you know, it's got that kind of classic mm -hmm. uh, X Men versus X Men, or you know, yeah, Avenger, or, you know, superhero team versus another superhero team, where they're both coming in from the side view. That's what I, that's the and vibe I get on it. Yeah, and then somebody in the front's like doing the the big thing that oh no, we're too busy fighting to see what's happening. Yeah. And there was something happening, but we'll get to that in a second. I, I, I'm going to show off a little bit because I looked and was like, do I know all of these Transformers on this uh, cover? And I think I do. Uh, if you're going from left to right, it's Ape Face, Bugly, Squeeze Play. Uh, I think that's Fangry, maybe? Yeah, Fangry. Skullgrin, Octane, Ratbat, Soundwave, and Razorclaw. Good job. And of course, Starscream. And of course, Buster. Oh, sh what are we going to do now? And I like the cover. Like, I I think um, Jared last month had a little bit um, to say about, like, some of the faces and everything. And what I told him, John, uh, was that we're going to see that. We're going to see mm -hmm. the different artists' interpretation of faces. And we're going to have some artists coming up in the very near future who are going to have their own interpretations mm -hmm. on um, how, you know, the Autobots or Decepticons and their faces look. So that's going to be interesting. And it'll be interesting to see what people think about it. I personally don't mind Starscream's face uh, here at all. And I like the cover overall as well. Uh, it's interesting, right, that, I mean, while there are plenty of Transformers on the cover, there are no Autobots. Uh, the only good guy, as it were, were Bu is Buster Witwick. And clearly Buster is not an Autobot. He's a human. Uh, but it's a very good cover. You got the prominent person that they wanted on, on front and center. There's about a dozen characters on the cover, and none of this appears crowded at all. So I like it a lot. Um, Pat, you gave a few comments just on what you thought about like the style of the cover. But what do you think about the cover overall? I like you. I don't mind the, the face on Starscream. I think it 
needs to be this way uh, just to show his kind of a menacing, you know, squinting eyes and grin. Like he's, you know, he's definitely mad at Buster for something and you don't know why. So I think I like that instead of just having like a plain, you know, basic robot face that shows no emotion at all. You have to do that. I think with the, you know, these transformers, I think they need some personality brought out a little bit into them. Uh, we, you know, I think we've seen that with Megatron too, with a, a few of those older ones where he's got like a grill or, you know, he's yep. that, that, that I like yeah. it's, it's whenever they have teeth that I usually don't like it as much as star has got way too many teeth for my taste. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe if they would have just not, not tried to separate the teeth, but just kept that as like a, you know, a straight metal grill Real, or whatever. As but, it were. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, but I, I don't know. I, I don't mind it. I think it's really cool that you have, again, the Decepticons against Decepticons. I kind of picked out a few of them, like Delvin said. Uh, I knew one one guy's like the Insecticon guy, right? The guy in the purple and the... Not in this case. He's one, he's one of the pretenders. Oh, like, the pretender. Oh, Because okay. the pretenders are all a part of Scorponaut's crew uh, from Nebula. Yeah. Yeah. And all the guys to the right are the Earthbound. Rat Bats crew. Yeah. Rat Bats crew. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I thought, oh, well, see, I'm still new. I don't know my all my Transformers, but That's what I like it. That's what we're here for, Pat. We're here to Well, from what I understand, uh, after next month, it gets a lot easier to keep track of them. I'm just, <laughs> I don't remember why. <laughs> John, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Before, you know, while I'm shushing you now, don't you? <laughs> uh, no, not really. Uh, I think everybody's pretty much covered it. It's it's kind of fun. It's uh, it's a great sort of cover, you know, for in a little mini event like this, the Underbase Saga, as they're calling it now. And so it's it looks pretty cool. Cool. So with that. <laughs> For our thoughts, we're going to rate the thing. If you don't know, here on Transformers Chronicles, we rate things on a scale of 1 to 10, like the tech specs of the original toys. 1 being the lowest, 10 being the highest. Who wants to talk about it first? John's taking a drink, so Pat's going to go first. What would you rate this cover? I think I would give this one a 7. I'm going to go a little bit higher, but, uh, you know, me, I will. I'm going to give it an 8. I like it. I think the coloring is fine. Things are popping. And there's a lot of definitely a lot of detail in the characters. I think it's a fun, busy cover. Uh, it tells what's going on in the book pretty accurately, um, not only in words, but with uh, the pictures as well. I like it a good deal um, I, to a 10. No, but to a strong eight. Definitely. I like it to the tune of an eight as well. Pat, John, what do you think? I like it. I don't like it as much as you guys do. I'll give it a seven. Just it's it's pretty good, but I don't think it quite hits the upper echelon tier, especially with some of them that we're about to be seeing over the next few months, too. But a seven is no slouch, and I give this one that. Absolutely. All the props in the world to Jose Delbo. Like, man, as we have Jared pointed it out as an artist last month, we pointed out quite a few times the man has had to draw a lot of Transformers yeah. <laughs> and like, and he has done a high quality job on it. So, um, well, and, and, and to that fact, Delvin, just for you to go through and name them all, that shows the detail that he did yes. mm -hmm. that you could call it out by the shape and the drawing that he did. Yep. He could have, he could have airmailed that like, Right. Some people yeah. might say the colorist airmailed it in, but Maybe. Delvo definitely didn't. So, so, some might. You know, some yes. people named John especially would. All right. We are going to continue to talk about the credits for the issue. Pat, take it away. Funny thing is, is John's colorblind, so he doesn't even know. What <laughs> <laughs> is. Today, we're going to be covering Transformers 49. Its on sale date was October 25th, 1988, but its cover date was February. Yeah, its cover date was February 1989. Cover price was $1. The story is by Bob Budiansky. Pencils go to Jose Delbo. Inks go to Danny Bulinati. Colors, Nelson Yamtov. Letters is Bill Oakley. Editor is Don Daly. 
cover credits go to Jose Delbo and Danny Bulinati. And this is all brought to you by Mike's Amazing World and TFWiki.net. Back to you, Delvin. It is a world transformed where things are not what they seem. It is the world of the Transformers. The Transformers, more than meets the eye. Autobots wage their battle to destroy the evil forces of the Decepticons. The title of this issue was Cold War. In the military, when you're writing up an email to someone high up in the ranks, you often start off that email with a bluff statement. Bluff is an acronym meaning bottom line up front. Used in a sentence? The bluff for this synopsis would be Starscream fools absolutely everyone in his quest to steal the underbase and become the most powerful bot or con ever. But under that bluff statement, you give the boss all the info they may need if they want to read it later or if they want to sound as smart as the people who crafted the email and did all that dang work. <coughs> so, here we go. The Scorbronaut-led Headmaster Contingency meets up with the Ratbat-led Earth-Stranded Decepticons, and tensions escalated quickly for any reason you can think of. Starscream was supposed to mention to Ratbat that Scorbronaut's team was on his way, but I guess it just slipped his mind. Mm. Which led to Ratbat's general annoyance that Scorbronaut's team was even there in the first place, which led to Scorbronaut having misgivings. Oh yeah, Ratbat doesn't like fleshlings, and a whole lot of fleshlings are on Scorbronaut's side, and Ratbat has all of his guys preparing to launch off for the underbase. The same underbase that Scorbronaut thought was a myth, along with everyone else but the folks who watched the take from last issue. Among those are Ratbat, Starscream, and Buster Witwicky, who Starscream dupes into telling Scorbronaut, who in turn is pissed that Ratbat did not tell him about this. The end result of that is a Decepticon battle royale, the likes of which we have not ever seen in the book. But Starscream was not done, no sir. As the battle began, Starscream escaped with Buster, dropping him off on a nearby iceberg and leaves him with two choices, freeze to death or use the Autobot Priority 1 emergency beacon that Starscream gave him to alert the Autobots of his whereabouts. Starscream then accosts Scorponok's ship and with Ratbat watching, blasts off into space in pursuit of the underbase. Buster sees that too, and though he knows it's setting a trap for the Autobots, which we saw a few of them in the book being nowhere near the main action, Buster activates the distress beacon. So let's talk about the book. On Transformers Chronicles, we talk about highs, we talk about lows, we talk about what does a discussion forms. Pat, what you got for this? Where do you want to start us off? Well, I think let's start us off with the obvious on this one. And this is a total star scream snow job. <laughs> he is, you know, just being Starscream, and I think th this is the best we've seen him. I, and, you know, and when I say best, I mean, you know, this is just Starscream at his top notch here doing what he Star Starscream does, and I really liked it. I just liked how kind of conniving and backstabby kind of a th thing that was going on, and all in all, you knew that He's got a method. He's got a plan that this is all starting to fall into place. And you start to see things like the dominoes start to fall and fall into place. And they're all like, everything is coming up Starscream in this one. So, you know, hats off to him. And and it's really surprising because it's not only it's him. Now it's him against Ratbat. And now he's also has to go against, you know, Scorpionot or the, what's the guy's name? Scorpionot, yeah, you're right. Um, you know, the, the head guy that, his headmaster guy, right? Yeah, Scorponok. You're right. Yeah. Well, he's got a name, doesn't he? What's his name? Scorponok. Yeah, but what's his headmaster name? Oh, Lord Zarak. Yeah, Lord Zarak. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I look at that as it's always kind of Lord Zarak, and he's kind of the, you know, the bigger brain of the two Scorponok and, and that guy. But, you know, 
because he's just, you know, he wouldn't be called Lord if he wasn't, you know, trying I, to. I mean, I, I think Scorpionock the robot would beg to differ on that path. Uh, please, but, let's not go down the road of who's in charge or how that well, works. Yes, again. We, <laughs> we, we, we won't do that because uh, I, I remember having to wrangle a whole heck of a lot of cats in. But, John, yeah, uh, yeah. Since, since you came off a of mute there, like, the, would, would you like to riff off of anything Pat said or, or are you branching off to somewhere new? Actually, no, I don't want you to branch off to somewhere new. No, I want you to. Off. Yeah, I want you to laud the praises of the machinations and schemes. I am going to laud the if you if one is a Starscream fan, and I am, uh, this issue and next issue are the issues for you for the, of the Budiansky run. Um, it's kind of funny as uh, we really. Uh, Bob really hasn't used Starscream all that much. Uh, he, no. he gets blown out of this. I mean, he showed up a bit in nine and fought against jazz and blue streak and then gets blown out of the sky by Omega Supreme and gets rescued a few issues ago. And now here he is that apparently he's making up for some lost time in a bit, but this is classic star scream. And, and let's not, I mean, let's not forget uh, Bob Budiansky invented star scream. He just he took a look. He decided that the bad guys needed a um, conniving backstabber, and they got him. He's my favorite. He's a lot of people's favorite, and he does some great stuff in here. And I'm glad to see it. Yeah, I want to keep going. I just like I read this book a few times, and it was just like the whole the the weaving of all of it. Like at some point, you knew that the um, all of the Decepticons had to get together at some point. They were all on Earth. Why would you not get together and, you know, band together to beat your hated rivals, the Autobots? And, like, that Starscream knew it. He organized it that they were coming and planned all of this stuff the way he... I mean, he just... It was like he was just this big puppeteer and everyone was his marionettes. And it was just, like... It was interesting to read, and I give Bob Budiansky a ton of credit for organizing this the way that he did. It was it was just very well done. But I I, I will talk less. I will pass it back to Pat uh, to either continue to praise Starscream or you can go anywhere else you want. Well, I think there is a couple of uh, stories going on in this one. Uh, you do have the Starscream, and now he's interacting with his i guess so and so leader and oh he's kind of undermining him along with the you know the headmaster leadership there or the pretenders and that but i also wanted to say i really enjoyed the talk or just the conversations that were going on between optimus and blaster because blaster's a little down on himself of you know hey i should have done this and better and then you got optimus who you know being the leader that he is, is he's not really putting him down at all, but you know, he's trying to build him back up and, um, you know, just help him out, get over, you know, the, the kind of dread that he's in or just the doubts that he's having right now. You know, I'm always big on the leadership stuff. Uh, and I like, I mean, I think oh, I, I like the optimist's approach because I mean, I mean, he could, he could, you know, have just, Lit yeah. Blaster up or whatever, but Blaster didn't do anything wrong. Blaster saw what was going on. Blaster had to fly back, you know, and then, you know, get back to base and then report everything that he saw to Optimus Prime and then get, you know, together and then get back to the Caribbean where I think they mm -hmm. are uh, right now at the Ark, right? And which mm -hmm. is freaking in like Washington State. So that's a long distance. And by that time, the Decepticons are like, okay. We found what we wanted. This gig is up. We're going to pack up everything and we're just going to move away so the Autobots won't discover us. Yeah. So I give them a lot. Like, th there was a lot of strategy afoot there uh, between both Autobots and Decepticons. I think that speaks to uh, how strategic of a leader Ratbat is. Because Ratbat was like, we're here for a reason. We'll throw up a ruse, you know, just to keep humans from being suspicious, which is exactly why... Uh, Optimus Prime didn't want to stay around that mm -hmm. spot too long because it would have attracted human attention. 
And so, like, Rat Bat saw that. It's like, we don't want human attention anymore. And uh, since this whole Club Con thing is up, we're going to pack up and we're going to move somewhere where the Autobots can't find us. A lot of strategy going on. Uh, John, do you agree? Yes. Disagree? I do agree. Can you imagine, like, when Starscream comes back online after they rescue him from the Ark in that big moon battle? And he's, like, gets brought back by every opens up his optics and looks around and, the and realize, what? Megatron has Fallen. Who's in charge then? What? <laughs> the tape? <laughs> oh, hell yeah! You know, he's immediately because he is so on. You could almost see him just hear him giggling in the background about this is the guy I got to overthrow. Well, I'm going to make this a good one then because Ratbat completely clueless. I mean, you know, he kind of suspects something up, but I think I, I said it a few months ago when, during that one when I gave Rap Bat the less the meets the eye for not mm -hmm. checking the personnel reports when you're deciding whether or not to revive Starscream or not. Well, here he's figuring out why in this case. I just yeah. want to point out, just as a complete aside before I forget, I really like this little Fortress Maximus as the the floating battle cruiser thing. I always, yeah, I was gonna I always liked that. And it's just, you know, they're hanging out there. But, I didn't oh, know he could float. I, sure. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, it, in the role of, like, it, say, Transformers, the movie wasn't Fortress. Like, Fortress Maximus, like, he's literally a city. No, that's Matroplex. Fortress Maximus. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he just he shows up later. But in that, he's even bigger. But in this case, yeah, I don't know. I guess I, I don't. It's one of the things you can turn him into is something that looks like that. And I, I guess it floats. I thought that was a well-drawn page. Like, maybe he's I got like, like mm -hmm. what's up, maybe, man? Maybe he's got, like, you know, jet propelled, just kind of keeping him floating in the water, or, you know. <laughs> I like that as a no prize. Um, or probably just a good explanation, not even a no prize. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just mentioned it again. I thought that page was very well drawn. I like how I like, I've always liked the look of Power Master Optimus Prime. I've mm -hmm. always thought that that was a very good look. And then Blaster was well drawn as well as uh, Fortress Maximus too. So all of that was well drawn too. Mm -hmm. uh, John, is there anything that you want to mention? Uh, just... I'll wait until we move on into the next thing, or I can move us on into it, I guess. It's Go just it. this fight. The fight between the Decepticons is incredible. It is brutal as hell. How many Decepticons die in this? Just get my favorite of them, and I go keep going back to this panel. It's on content page 20, where Scorponok is just tearing that Predacon apart. With a he, zap. I love the line that he gave too. Well, he's like, because he's like, I'll see you scrap score for knock. And he's like, a threat of dubious promise tantrum from one in your condition. Oh, and <laughs> well, just this metal, like, God. Oh. Yeah. And I want to mention, Pat, because you asked whether or not we're going to see the Seacons again. And I said, no, I was wrong. We saw the Seacons a lot. They like yeah. combined and performed per and yeah, they combined oh, and formed Piranacon, and they were about to destroy Scorponok's ship. So, and they also participated in the big battle. So, we did get to see the Seacons again. Yeah, you're right. I I was about done with combiners. I think we all were by the time that the Seacons came out. Well, I guess there was still after that were the Technobots and the Terracons. If I remember, mm -hmm. came after them. I think or maybe the Seacons were the last ones. I think the Terracons were in this one because I remember seeing Octane uh, blast his um, okay. flame weapon at Blot, and Blot's a Terracon. Um, but okay. I, we, I don't know if we see the Technobots or not. If we do... I don't think we did unless they were in the Headmasters one. Yeah, they may have been in the Headmasters. They were. Oh, they were in the Headmasters, but I don't know if we see them in main continuity. Any of that. Pat, what did you think about the fight? I liked it. I thought it was, again, fun and just to see the different powers and Decepticons going after each other. And Jose Delbo on the artwork, again, is just amazing to look at in this one. I was like, man, there's so much detail in every panel mm -hmm. and so many 
robots or just, you know, tra- transformers in here. It's just like, wow, how long did it take him to draw? You know, it, it's like, how many pages is this fight? <laughs> Man, you ain't you seen know, five, nothing yet. Six, seven. Yeah. And, wow. Yeah, I think you're going to like next uh, month if you liked uh, his drawing of robots. There's a lot yeah. of lot of there, characters in the next one. There's going to be a lot of robots in uh, issue 50. Uh, that's not giving away much. And um, yeah, but Jose, Jose earned his money. I don't know what they paid the man, but he probably should have gotten double. Yeah. <laughs> what, <laughs> it's like, I, I hope he had a good pay rate for a page. Because he definitely put his money's worth into it. Yeah. Outside of, I'm sorry, Pat, just outside of maybe the Star Wars comic book, you can't, I can't really think of a licensed product like this in which that there's this much care has been put into it. I mean, it helps that it goes on for 80 issues, but especially now in this point, he's, I mean, he's peaked as far as I'm concerned. We're going to, and then, I think he has a few more issues. How long does he go before they move on? Because Furman's coming out pretty... Furman comes in 56. Yeah, that's right. And I I think he brings an artist with him on. I think he does. I I think if Del Bo stays on, it ain't for long. Mm -hmm. Because I know the main two artists for Furman's run, and it wasn't Del Bo. Del Bo has, mm, I think, under a year left. In the book. Oh well, he's definitely put his mark. I mean, if if you got a, mar- a Mount Rushmore of Transformers artists, you got to put him on there for this. And this issue is one of the issues. Why? It's, this is some crazy stuff. I mean, it, it's just to look at it again and really go th- for a kid's card. You know, a kid's toy based comic. The amount just showing the the tra- the like on content page like 18 where they're shooting at each other and then in the background they're showing tra- them transforming into their the things and in, in the background up above there you've got astro train transforming and just knocking people over and poor old uh, people getting chopped in half and stuff it's like the it's like the beginning of transformers the movie where everybody remembers that hey wait we're deadly and <laughs> yeah yeah, um, I mean, just on um, you mentioned content page eighteen and then content page nineteen. You got like a, a arm snapped off, or mm-hmm. robots sawed in half, and robots getting run over. Mm-hmm. Like one gets smacked in the he- face with the, the freaking arm that he spat out. Like they, <laughs> that was so great. They, they, I love that one. I love that one. Uh, they, there were no expenses spared. There were no holds barred, and it was an incredible fight to see like where, and the cool thing about it was it happened very organically. You saw how this was built throughout the entire, and he could, so we were talking, this is content page, what, 18 content page 20. So Mm -hmm. by the time it got there, it's like Jose and, and Bob set this up in 16 pages where these robots who had never met each other had all the reason in the world to want to destroy each other. And it's it all because of Starscream. <laughs> all because of Starscream and Starscream's machinations. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, Pat, what do you think about how Starscream handled Buster? And what do you think about the predicament Buster was put in? Well, I, you know, I think Starscream still has some other things up his sleeve because he is putting Buster... I guess he wants the Autobots, my take on it, is he wants the Autobots to come and save Buster, and while he's saving them, they're going to find the what's ever left of this Decepticon fight here, and, you know, he's, he just wants the Autobots to kind of wipe out the rest of the, you know, wipe out his competition of the Decepticons. And then probably by that time, he'll find what he's looking for, and then he'll be able to come back and take care of the, rest of the Autobots. I'm well, I guess we don't have to read 50 now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, those are some interesting theories, Pat. And, mm-hmm. and I think that that's, a, that's pretty easy to assume that it might happen. It might. Because, yeah, I don't. Well, because nah, even I'm just basing this off of what we have from 49. Mm-hmm. Starscream, mm-hmm. like, you know, he freaking jettisons 
bust her out and, and you know, it's like, no, I don't care whether you live or die. That's up to you, man. Like, yeah, yeah, here's this yeah. distress beacon and, and Buster figured out is like, if I press this button and a whole fleet of Autobots come, their odds of surviving are very low because they don't know that the Decepticons are two miles away yeah. and they're going to see all of these Autobots coming and they're going to ambush all of these Autobots and it's going to be a slaughter. Mm-hmm. So, and so it doesn't matter. So it, it, even if the Autobots got there, they knew the Decepticons were there and they wiped out the Decepticons. So the Decepticons came and wiped out the Autobots. All of that takes time anyway. And in all of that time, Starscream is somewhere in outer space, getting closer and closer to the underbase, getting mm-hmm. all of the power that he wants. So I don't, I haven't spoiled anything. This is everything yeah. that we can infer, right? Yep. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Mm. You just made the previously on Transformers Chronicles pretty easy <laughs> next month. So, <laughs> so I, I just, I don't know. That have I have we forgotten anything else in this discussion? Is there anything that you wanted to bring up, Pat? I'm just going back to the fight, and I don't know who job it is to keep track of all these characters, all these. But for Jose to you know do that and draw them you know, at more accurate than we, what we've seen in the past, just hats off to whoever had to keep track of that and like, okay, we got to put this guy here and this guy here. And you know, these are guys you want and I'll draw them. It's like, yeah. wow. Yeah. You know, so yeah. many different characters that he has to draw. It's just amazing. So, and I'm also thinking from Bob's side that there has to be like a battle yeah. board or something. Yeah. Like There's gotta be somebody keeping these chess pieces, you know, here's all that's here. Yeah. Yeah, but I agree. G.I. Joe, I really can't. There are very few comics that have a cast of characters that is this large, even though most of them are not. I'd say most of them are not seen more than one or two times, but it is still yeah. a big cast to have around, especially when you want to do things like this and bring a ton of them back. Mm-hmm. And you have to figure out, you know, like who's alive, who's dead. Who, you know, who's an operative? Where did I leave this person? Like, can Shockwave show up? Nope, Shockwave can't show up because he fell off to down to earth to parts unknown. We still don't know where Shockwave is, et cetera, et cetera. Like, oh, and for that, can Megatron show up? No, Megatron disappeared somewhere in the space bridge. So who knows where the heck he is, whether he's ever coming back. He's, he's coming, he's coming back. He's coming but back. I, I can't, I can't tell you when or why or how. I mean, because that'd be spoiling it. But yes, yeah. You, anyway, big old chessboard. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> John, did you have anything else? Uh, no, I think we hit it all. This has been fun, and we kind of all covered what it is. And it's a gr- one of the better setup issues that I think I've seen. A lot of times when you have an obvious setup to the big payoff, the setup can be lacking because of that, you know, because the energy is being, like, saved. We saw it before, like the ones leading up to the moon fight, that there was a little bit, or this, this one's solid. This is a great issue. You called it a heist before in the intro, and it totally is. That's it's, it. Isn't till the end that you realize, you know, if Starscream could be explaining, and then, you know, you could have him as a voiceover in the background explaining all the little things he did and did it, and he won. It's one of Starscream's uh, better successes in any medium of Transformers. You got to hand it to him. Nice. <laughs> Now is the time for us to talk about who had the touch. Will we talk about which character in the book stood up? Is it Starscream? It's it Starscream. It <laughs> um, well, really, I think it's... Um, yeah, it's Starscream. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I could have belabored that point, but like, I, I am well aware that it is Starscream. It is definitely Starscream. I have been a fool. Made mistakes monumental ones but i am just a broken machine and i do things that don't really so we will quickly 
move on. And if we have talked about the touch, then someone had to be out of touch. We talked about the character that was the worst in the book and get smacked in the face with the arm he just bit off of the guy <laughs> in the segment called Less Than Meets the Eye. John, who was Less Than Meets the Eye to you? I uh, gotta give it, I'm gonna give it a five part tie to the Predacons, who yet again, when called upon to be the best of the best, all seem to die. <laughs> so, um, man, they just never really performed very well in any of their appearances. You know, all sizzle, no steak on those folks. They still look yeah. cool. I'd still love one. Uh, that Predaking looks awesome, but uh, rest in peace, all y'all. Yeah, Preda King had an awesome look, and I just still remember that, like, freaking before Megatron went out in that place of glory, he was like, oh, I'm taking you out with me. Blammo! I mean, just, oh, man. Anyway, so like, it's, <laughs> that, who was less than meets the eye to you? I think I'm going to go with Rat Bat. I think just because, you know, just letting Starscream kind of manipulate him and, you know, come on, dude, you should be smart enough to kind of... It's like he kind of saw it come. He's like, oh, okay, well, you fooled me. You know, right. Pat, I, I see where you're coming with that, but and and Lord knows we're not going to be able to weave this song into it, but he got hit by a smooth criminal. Dude. Yeah, exactly. He yep. absolutely did. Like, I don't, I don't think that Rat Bat was particularly dumb because, like, even from the start, where he was like, when Star Screaming yeah. arrived on the screen, it's like, put the ship down, put the ship down carefully. Yeah. And Rat Bat's like, okay, you don't deserve my yeah. trust, but why? Oh, <laughs> Del Delvin, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Smooth, oh, to a, the smooth criminal thing. Oh. Yeah. Uh, no, just I the the thing I, you just reminded me of with all of that is the thing that Megatron had going for him is that. Starscream could try to pull whatever he wanted to, and he could only get so far before Megatron would go, what the blam? Ratbat yeah. can't physically take Starscream, <laughs> and if Starscream gets him into a point, he has no recourse, <laughs> so let's see what happens next month. Yeah, I think that Ratbat would have been better served to have somebody around, like a bodyguard protecting him, like like a sound wave. Sound maybe. wave would have been a good one. Yeah, yeah he, he should have had a sound wave to protect him at all uh, at all costs because even as he was like flying around the field of battle, he was about to die. <laughs> yeah, he was flying around for his life. Yeah, until he got saved. So yeah, um, well, I mean, Megatron has sound wave around for exactly that purpose in IDW. Watch sound wave is usually yeah. always depicted as the true believer in the cause, no matter what. And so yeah. he's not going to, he's fanatically loyal to Megatron as long as Megatron's following the cause. So he's going to stand in the way and he can fight from what I've seen in a, the new Transformers comic recently. Jeez. Yeah. And can he? And so I'll pick my less than me CI and I, I did give it away um, in the description, but I just found it hilarious that Rampage got a great win because they face was like, I'm super agile. You can't catch me. And Rampage was like, oh, yeah, but he spat his arm back at him and Rampage <laughs> on his own arm. His and own smacked arm. him in the face with it. Like, oh, that was so cold. That is that is pretty good. <laughs> Just a part of a tremendous battle royale. And now it's the time for the overall ratings of the book. To recap for the audience, we will honor the tech specs that came with every Transformers toy and give a rating of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, to describe how we felt about this issue. It's felt like it's been a long time since I've actually read the boilerplate for that. Felt kind of good. 1 to 10. Uh, I'm starting off. like I, From the moment I read this book the first time from start to finish, I was like, this is a 10. Like This was like the seminal Starscream story. But it also was like to talk about everything. This is part three of four of the Underbay saga. And part one, they didn't even, the part one, they didn't even explain what the Underbase was per se, just that they were after some tapes that were going to tell about some unknown, like powerful treasure. And then Part two of the Underbase Saga, we found out exactly what that was and exactly how powerful the Underbase was and that it's coming towards Earth. And part three is finally that big reveal where like all the Decepticons got together, but they couldn't get along and Starscream got away with the heist. 
to get the biggest jump on getting towards that underbase. He hadn't gotten it yet, but as of right this second, the Autobots know nothing about the underbase. No. Nothing at all. So only the Decepticons do. And, 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 that, and at that, the only Decepticon that's even halfway close to getting the underbase at this point is Starscream. So anyways, I just wanted to set the table for all that to say that part three of the three or four was just fantastic to me. So it's a 10. Uh, let's give it to Pat. Pat, what are you rating? I'm going to agree with you on this one. It is a 10. And I think we kind of mentioned it before that this was all thriller and, and that going on in this one, especially with what Starscream was planning on doing that you would have think like, okay, it's issue three. It's going to be some more stretching this thing out a little bit more and just kind of weighing you along to get to issue four where the big stuff is going to happen. But there's a lot of big stuff that happened in this one. And so it really then ties back, like you said, issues one and two to culminate to three. I liked it. Culmination. John, what would you rate? Transformers 49? Uh, it's much like you. It pretty much got a 10 right away. I remember this one at the buying it back in the day because I had... Uh, for whatever reason, hadn't been buying the ones pretty much since Optimus Prime came back. Between that one and this one, I didn't really buy any of the ones in between there. Just I don't really remember why. I might have been get, I was thirteen, so I might have been getting too old for that and looking at girls or whatever. But this one on the on the spinner rack like sold me right back. The cover did it, and the issue was great and. Uh, and I loved it then. I loved it now. The next one's going to be really fun to talk about, <laughs> and, but it gets a 10. Yeah. Um, this is one case I'm glad that we're all in agreement. And like, no one had to really go with each other into it. It was just a, simply a fantastic book. So hat off, hats off to Bob and the rest of the crew for putting together an outstanding comic book. We can and will never leave you without John's segment of the show that he's back to read called Transformer Spotlight, where he discusses a particular Transformer, which was featured in today's issue. Go for it, John. All right. Uh, I, it had been a long time since I've done this before, and I couldn't really remember, so I just panicked and grabbed Skywarp because he's in there. <laughs> and So, Skywarp, here's what... Uh, is on the back of his box. Skywarp's allegiance is Decepticon. His subgroup is Seekers, and his function is Warrior. His motto is Strike when the enemy isn't looking. Skywarp is the sneakiest of all deceptions. Man, that's saying something. Uh, enjoys playing cool pranks on fellow Decepticons and appearing out of nowhere to attack Autobots. Not too smart. Would be useless without Megatron supervision. Top speed of 1500 miles per hour and can instantly teleport up to 2.5 miles. Carries heat seeking missiles and variable caliber machine guns. Uh, here's what his rank stats were stated on the card. They gave him a strength of 7, an intelligence of 9, a speed of 10, endurance 7, rank 9, courage 9, firepower 8, and skill 8. If that doesn't make any sense to you, you're not alone. It's been accepted by the Transformers community that these stats are actually supposed to be Starscreams and that Starscream stats for Skywarp, and it seems to fit, because with that in mind, his actual stats are Strength 7, Intelligence 7, Speed 9, uh, let's see, Endurance 7, Rank 5, Courage 8, Firepower eight, 7, Skill 7. It still doesn't match the fact that he's supposed to be dumb, but man, it's a relative, it's a sliding scale. Uh, what's funny is I remember there was a series of Transformers coloring books that were out back in the day at the time, and that's like the only time I've ever seen any depiction of Skywarp dealing with the fact that he likes to play practical jokes on his fellow Decepticons, as this says, but pretty much they ignore that for the lore. Uh, for most of Marvel Transformers, he's uh, pretty much just there. 
Um, as well as in the cartoon, they, he takes it back to Starscream and the rest of the Seekers, but I think that's dumb because he teleports and that is awesome. IDW uses him a bit better. There's a long story arc in Phase 3 where his teleportation is on the fritz and so he joins G.I. Joe. Really. He actually joined G.I. Joe. <laughs> and um, there is some pretty fun stuff in there with that, with the Sky Striker and him. Uh, we'll pop, maybe we'll eventually get to it on the ride. But uh, yeah, that is Skywalk. Thank you to tfwiki.net and tfu.info for that information. And thank you, John. Good to hear you saying that again, man. And we will go to a promo break. Transformers will return after these messages. Hello, soldiers. I'm Jared Albrecht, the yard sale artist, codenamed Death Probe, and I'm here to give you your orders to join me and my elite podcasting squad for G.I. Joe Chronicles. Who makes up this elite squad, you may ask? It starts with my right hand man, Pat Sampson. Tell him your code name and specialty, Pat. Well, Jared, I'm glad you asked. My codename is DJ Cristados, and on G.I. Joe Chronicles, I specialize in G.I. Joe comic books, Marvel, Devil's Due, IDW. We cover them all, but there's so much more in the G.I. Joe Chronicles universe, and that's where our first sergeant comes in. He's Jim Mill. Sound off with your codename and specialty, Jim. My specialty is everything else G.I. Joe. I'm going to talk about some comics too, but I'm also going to look at the G.I. Joe property from lots of different angles, including, but not limited to, the toys, cartoon, puzzles, train sets, bed sheets, Halloween costumes, you name it, and there's probably a Joe version of it, and I'm going to let you know it exists. You forgot to tell the troops your codename. Oh yeah, codename Weasel Skull. I don't think you can have that one. I, I think it's taken. Dang. How about codename Weasel Skull? Strangely enough, that's also taken. Orsted. Oh, that's like a beautiful name, man. We could be cosmically. Okay, never mind. Never mind. I got it. Codename Dark Web. No. Pop Pop Hiss. No. Pimp Destro. No. Hot Thing. No. While my battle buddies get that ironed out, I invite you to join us for GI Joe Chronicles. You can listen to it on its own solo feed wherever podcasts are found or catch it under the Longbox Crusade Network umbrella. We look forward to seeing you at Fort Longbox. Yo, Yo Joe. Joe! Okay, how about Jim the Joe Junkie? Uh, maybe. We now return to the Transformers. Now it's time for transmissions where we heap praise upon the audience for listening to us. Thank you all so much. We're going to talk about Transformers Chronicles, episode 46, where we discuss Transformers issue 46. And we can read, uh, yeah, we can read all of the comments here. It should not take a very long time. I will start with. Uh, very quick, just we got one social media share and retweet from uh, Serpy Matt. Uh, that would be Matt Posso. Thank you so much. Uh, would love for more people to like and uh, retweet or like is fine. We appreciate a lot. Yeah, we definitely but got a lot of likes. Um, we got a lot of likes. Mm -hmm. uh, Think those retweets. Yes. Uh, share and a retweet will uh, get you read here on the show, and we would love to read mountains of names on the show who have shared and retweet. So be like Matt Passo and go ahead and uh, share and retweet. And we will start reading a few of the comments that we got. Uh, John, you want to read the first one? Sure. Uh, Herbert Fung is back uh, saying another great episode. I can't remember this issue either. Looks like they're just tossing in fillers until issue 50 comes out. Well, Herbert, not quite as we've seen. But yeah, I remember. What Was this the Sparkabots one? It was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> um, I got to got to go back and listen to that one. Uh, sadly, I don't think I can follow along with many more cover homages. By this time in the line, I didn't find the toy line to be that appealing with their offerings. Yeah, that is unfortunately the case, Herbert. I agree with you there. Uh, but I figure I'll at least do an Optimus versus Motormaster scene as it might have been attempted by kids back in the day. We all did that one. I can see why Optimus would have won, though. He, so, and he's got a lovely picture of Optimus Prime uh, about to could crash head on with Motor Master, who is notably smaller than Prime. And I'm going to give that one to Optimus. 
Yeah, Mona Master looks like Optimus Prime's son. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and and not and not one of those cases where the son grew to be bigger than the dad either. Uh, so yeah, uh, Pat, you want to read the next comment? All right, I'll take the next one from Scotty Cameron, and Scotty says the Sparkabots are truly less than meets the eye. Yes, they are. <sighs> Uh, I, I want to give something in the Sparker Boss defense, but like, I think we even mentioned on the show that one just really, really felt like a toy commercial. And yeah. Bob did, did through the entire run made this so much more than just a comic book that was trying to shill toys. Uh, but that one just really kind of felt like it. Uh, so yeah, I get it. Uh, we got a comment from Mike Pepper who says, I have this. I'm glad that you have this, Mike Pepper. And since that was short, I'm taking another one. Rod Lynch says, I always liked that issue. And I also always wish that they would feature the road jammers more than once. They were a pretty cool little group of villains. I agreed, actually. Uh, the, the road, road jammers, jammers were, oh, yeah. They were pretty resourceful. And I, I kind of like, it seemed like they may have hinted that they were going to come back at some point. So it would have been interesting to see, like, if Bob Budiansky had stayed on longer, whether or not he would have eventually brought the road jammers back or not. I think I, I actually know something about that, if I'm remembering right, and I may be confusing them with something else, but they were they did have a circuit breaker and a group a uh, comic spinoff planned. It might have been the Road Jammers. The whole idea was, I guess it was going to be, they'd be teaming up with Roadie War Machine. And the whole premise would have been apparently all of the Transformers in from, uh, experience that they had apparently was going to be revealed to have been uh, just virtual reality stuff that they saw in order to train them. And they were going to be running off and fighting like Iron Man vill villains and stuff. And that would have huh. been super. And Furman was going to write it. Huh. Simon Furman was going to write it. So that would have been interesting. <laughs> you haven't heard the last from us. Oh, wait, you have, says the Road Jammers. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Uh, let's see. Who was next? I forgot. Uh, I think it's me. Or, yeah, go ahead then. But then I just closed the thing. So it should be someone else. Um, Pat, you want to read Christopher? Sure. Let's call me. All right. I'll take the next one from Christopher Christopher Ouellette, and he says, "Fun show." As you guys, as you described the cover, I was able to remember it. I still have no memory of the story. <laughs> it seemed that way for most people. I, I, yeah. it, it was just one of those, you know, especially sandwiched in between, um, like the Underbase Saga and then the Return of Optimus Prime and stuff. Who knows? Maybe it was just one of those that are, were forgotten. And last comment, uh, thank you very much to all of our Spotify listeners. And we normally always get a comment from Scotty Cameron, and this is, time is no different. He says, great episode. Love the review of the comic where the Sparkabots get punked by WWE star. <laughs> mm. There's a guy named Randy Horton did a whole thing. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if we happen to miss a few... Uh, comments or anything, we do apologize. It's certainly a good problem to have, but we don't want to forget to recognize anyone. Ping us about it on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and we will correct it on the next issue. <laughs> Everyone, that is the show. Please come back and join us for the next episode where we discuss Transformers issue 50. It's the big one where we see part four of the Underbase saga, which will have ramifications for the rest of the Transformers run. That's a guarantee. If you like to hear more from us, the Long Box Crusade, we are a lot of places. Apple Podcasts and most podcasters, too, includes the aforementioned Spotify at www.longboxcrusade.com, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Patreon. You look for Long Box Crusade, you will find us. We would love for you to join our Patreon Crusaders Club. For $1 a month, you can uh, be a part of all this madness. We give a lot of free swag out. Uh, we have a do a live stream where we give prizes out there, too. Uh, we just love to have you along with us for the ride. We are about 46 deep right now. And, heck, we can be 460 deep. All I care. We'd love to have that. Um, subscribe to us on YouTube. 
Uh, we have that do it live stream show uh, every second Sunday. We have a show uh, also called Come Out to Play. We're talking about the new Warriors and a lot of other content as well. We are dropping podcast content on YouTube, usually to the tune of about twice a week at least. So we got a lot of stuff there. We'd love for you to like and subscribe, any and all of it. And we have a voicemail as well. You can leave us voicemail comments about this show or any other show. 707-532-5269. That is 707-532-LBOX. Pick, Pick up the phone. phone. Did you hear that harmony? Where are you going to get that harmony from? Nowhere. Uh, nowhere, I say. Uh, you can also email us, contact at longboxcrusade.com. And John, it's good to have you back, man. Um, glad to have you back and let everyone know where you can be found out on social media. Oh, and maybe your right. podcast, too. Uh, where are we lately? Uh, we are married with content. We've been on a bit of a hiatus for a bunch of real life reasons. That's going to change uh, here soon. Uh, we just basically talk about all kinds of nerdy things, whatever Maggie, my wife Maggie and I, whatever comes to our minds, comic books, cartoons, movies, whatever we're into. Um, you can find us, just all the podcatchers, married dot 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 with content. Uh, or just married with content, you'll find it. Uh, social media wise, the best place to find uh, the podcast right now is on Blue Sky Threads or Instagram, where uh, we are MWC underscore podcast. Uh, otherwise, send an email to us if you feel like it to married w card wait married w comics at gmail dot com. Uh, where can we find, who am I asking? Pat, where can we find you? <laughs> well, John, I'm glad you asked. You can find me on the Twitter at Christatos01. Delvin, where can you be found? I can be found on Twitter, D-E-E underscore R-A-Y-1977. Instagram at Delvin Ray. See y'all next time. And remember, freedom is the right of all sentient beings till all are one. Till all are one. one. Till all are one. Till all are one. Till all are one. Till all are one. Three, two, one. Previous. Stay here. Just go to that. There we go. He's gaming. I'm going to keep going. Are y'all good? Did you see the, anybody see the trailer for Transformers 1? Yeah. I just saw that that looks pretty oh, fun. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it does. I saw it and I'm like, they're sort of doing like a, a buddy buddy thing with Optimus Prime and Megatron back in, in the, the, where they stopped. I was like, oh, I like yep. it. I like There's, it a lot. It looks like they're, and that's um, retreading some of IDW's ground. But it's kind of, you know, hitting the same marks, too. It's there from this. So that's going to be pretty interesting. Are you still reading uh, the new Transformers? Oh, yeah. That's that's uh, something. I'm curious to see how the G.I. Joe thing is going to be. It's in I the G.I. Joe team that they have in this is much better for a universe with Transformers in it right out of the gate. Because for me their crossovers that they've had in the past just never quite yeah. gelled right. They, yeah. they tried this. They're setting it up. They're in the same universe and, mm -hmm. and it works. I mean, my God, Cobra law for God's sake. The, the thing that just makes me just smile and nod my head is like, it's very clear that these folks got together and they had a love and affectation and they're just like, and at this point between both properties, like as far as toys, like Hasbro was like, hey, you can do what you want to. Like, it's, it's not like, Kids are so married to both of these properties <laughs> at this point. We know that we're doing this for like the 30 and 40 year olds. And so like just the comic book for Transformers alone, it's like you can tell just how like, I mean, they are just mm -hmm. like, oh, it's Pat, like man, there was the last one I read, I think, which was eight uh, Starscream had been running the team and Soundwave was like, Dude, you're just chaotic and you're not really doing anything with a plan. I challenge you for leadership with the Decepticons. And Starscream was like, what? No. And the other Decepticons were like, this is our well, way. This is what we do, dude. <laughs> this is what we do. And so they fought and Soundwave kicked his Like, yeah. it, it was like, I it was, that. I it was the that. best 
freaking oh. sound wave moment I have ever seen. With like, his own arm. Oh my god! Just, <laughs> oh, crazy! I mean, just it's so, very good. Thank you for listening.